So in Acts 14, verse 27, says, And now when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them, and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Here in the context is the apostle Paul and Barnabas, after the first missionary journey, coming back to the, the churches that have sent them out, in particularly in Antioch of Syria, and to and going on to the churches in Jerusalem, to beginning to give a report of all the missionary work that had been done and accomplished. So, and with the direction and with a focus to give glory to God for those good things. So today is just to, uh, the point is to catch you up on what's been going on in Guatemala and to be able to explain some of that work and to give glory to God together for the good things that he's done. So first off then I would want to tell you the outline that I would I'm going to follow is just a great commission outline. I'm going to tell you about the evangelistic work there. I'm going to tell you about the discipleship work there and then about the church planting work there. Tonight is going to be more Q&A. So if you, I know you'll have questions from that, but tonight we'll have a fellowship time, five o'clock. If that's still, is that still the time? Five o'clock? And at five o'clock we'll, we'll talk about any kind of questions that you would have about the ministry. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mark Mudge, and, or Marcos Mudge, depending on where I am. So I'm a missionary to Guatemala, and I've been sent there to plant a church from our church here, Cornerstone Baptist Church, in the city of Guatemala. So I, I want to just introduce Guatemala to you and a little bit of who's there. So the country of Guatemala is... Uh, right under Mexico, Central America. It's about the size, uh, geographically, but the size of Tennessee. It has about 14 million people in it, and about 4 million of those people are in the capital city. We're in the capital city, Guatemala City, easy to remember. And the city and the country is one that the demographics of it, what it's like, is that religiously is about 50% Catholic and about 46% evangelical. Now, the way that the, the people, what the, how they think is they've been overcome by the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel is what is the dominating lie of the city. Thanks, brother. That's very kind of you. The Pew Research Center is a reputable research center. 2014, they did extensive studies for religion in Latin America, and they surveyed about the prosperity gospel. And the way they define that is by asking the question, that it, do you believe that if you have faith, you will receive health and wealth in this life? Pretty simple, right? Well, nine out of ten Protestants in Guatemala City believe that. 89%, 89% of Catholics believe that. So that, that was surprising to me. So if you get 90% of, of evangelicals and 89% of Catholics, and if you're, you're adding up the math, Dr. Dodge, you, know, you, um, you get about 96% is either Catholic or Protestant. Basically, nine out of ten people you meet believe in the prosperity gospel. That's, uh, that's grieving, um, surprising. So if you consider Latin America, right? Guatemala has the highest percentage of evangelicals in Latin America. So many consider, when they look at missions, they consider Guatemala as a place not to send missionaries because of how reached it is. It's, and they, they don't can understand because of the prosperity gospel and Catholicism, it is a completely unreached country. It's an unreached country and that in the same way you would talk with a Mormon and they would define faith different or you talk with a Mormon and they define repentance different or almost any term you use, <laughs> the Bible, apostles, priests, they have a different definition. In the same way, somebody who believes the prosperity gospel has many different definitions. You can use the same word, but have defined them differently. So if I stand up and talk about faith, they have a different understanding about what faith it means. 
than what you would have as a well, reformed Christian. So the country is given over to these lies of Catholicism and prosperity thinking. It's very prevalent and very strong. The, the Catholicism is stronger than it is here as well. It's more people believe it, M more people, they'll often during holiday times, they'll have the processions of idols where they come with incense in the street, they carry idols of Mary, of a black Jesus, they have a, being like uh, a statue crucified and they have many people carrying these. They'll have, maybe sometimes they'll have all nuns carrying this, the statue of Mary and during Christmas time. We, we saw a lot of that. And they have people who follow behind the processions of idols. They have people with drums and trumpets be, so that nobody can preach. You can't hear anything as the, the idols pass through. They've got it planned out. So I'm giving that as an illustration to say how strong the Catholicism is, that this is a regular practice and, and something that they, the country takes pride in, that around, these, around holidays they parade the idols to the streets and they give veneration or worship to these idols. So there's a great need in Guatemala for the gospel. There's a great need in Guatemala for the gospel. Guatemala has had a history of... Uh, of great violence and atrocities from the 1970s to the 1990s. The, there were 200,000 people who were killed in the countrysides um, between, because of a w civil wars between uh, communist guerrillas on the countryside and then a military run CIA backed government that was uh, presentation is understanding the history and in the 20th century of Guatemala understand helps you understand how evangelicalism rose in Guatemala it rose in the 19 particularly in the 1980s when e, uh, when Pentecostal president got elected Rios Montt and he is now that guy is now in jail okay He's now in jail for war crimes but at the time he was a president in the 1980s he was considered a pastor and president of the, of the country. Every Sunday night, he'd preach a sermon to the country, and he helped Pentecostalism rise in Guatemala, going from a very small percentage, like 3% of the people, to then escalating um, to what it is now. And it's still on the rise. It's still on the rise. If, if you compare it from the 2014 uh, a Pew Research numbers, they would, they would have um, around 41% of the country evangelical, and then you would get a more recent update from the newspaper, they have risen to 46%. So in a matter of three years, evangelical, evangelical numbers have gone up 5% in the country. So I'm just trying to give you numbers to give you an idea of what is, a, what is it like there. What is it like to talk to people about the gospel? What is it like? What do, what do people think about when it comes to God, the Bible? Every, almost everybody you meet, they'll say, oh, I'm a Christian. And 19 out of 20 people you meet say, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. And, but nobody knows the gospel. Nobody knows the gospel. There is a, a great dependence in works righteousness. If you talk to somebody, you ask them, do you believe you're a good person? In Guatemala, a lot of people will say, no, I'm not a good person. And then you ask, so what, what, what's your hope? How will you have your sins forgiven? And then they give a good person solution. They say, oh, I'll try harder. I'll try harder. They, they say, they know the right thing to say and think is, well, I'm not a good person because they're very religious. But then when you say, what's the solution? They have a good person solution. They don't really believe themselves to be as bad as the Bible describes that we are. And so, the, uh, then, so we're in this country, right? Country that's given over to Catholicism and prosperity gospel, these false gospels. And so then, how, how do we fit in there? So the Rusi family and the Mudge family are living in an apartment in the, <clears throat> Central part of the city. We're downtown in a fifth-story apartment, sharing that together. 
and it is a great blessing to be able to to live with them lee is currently looking for work and going through the immigration process in order to be able to get his papers in order to be able to work there he's had an interview recently but it but it was for a very small amount and be able to pay the rent uh, kind of job so He's hoping for his paperwork to come through in the next few months so that he can pursue that. He has been a great help and a great blessing in the ministry. We've done everything together. I couldn't ha be more thankful for the, uh, the partnership. Gabby is running the homeschool. She's doing a, a, a good job raising Judah and Ezra. They, it's exciting to see them begin to get friends that are in the neighborhood so that they alert, they're speaking more Spanish. And <laughs> it's surprising how much they know and then they, they don't say it in the house until they get a friend in the neighborhood who doesn't know any English. And then how much they see them be able to grow with their Spanish. They know more than they let on. <laughs> and <laughs> the Benjamin is growing fast and he is a little Spanglish machine. <laughs> Uh, he doesn't understand the difference between Spanish and English, so he just mixes them all together. And uh, Ashley has been is here, and they've been, a, uh, of course, my a great blessing to be able to serve with, and great help with all the ladies. The uh, so that's a little bit of introduction, the country, who we are, what we're doing, and then now I'll get into the outline some stories about evangelism, some stories about discipleship, and then about church planning. So first off with evangelism. In evangelism, we're trying to make use of various means. So we'll try and do street evangelism, we'll try and do open air preaching, we'll try and do what is a newer evangelism for me, what I would call synagogue evangelism. So in some of the street evangelism there, we don't typically go door to door because there's so many people in the streets that it doesn't make much sense. If there are so many people walking by to knock on a door where you don't see somebody and I can't like, um, because there in Guatemala, the houses are all like a little fortress. You know, if you've been outside the US in many places in Eastern Europe and Latin America and Africa, um, many of the islands where you, go, where you go, the houses are like a little fortress. You know, you gotta knock on a, uh, well, a metal door and they got razor wire uh, so you can't jump the fence and that's just how everybody lives. And, and so in order to get into the fortress, it doesn't make much sense when I got, people walk, I got more people I can, I can evangelize walking in the street. It's very easy. It's very easy just, to, and people are more open to conversation culturally there than they are here. So it's not the same where you, get home, you leave your work and then you, you get in the highway and then you drive and into your, you hit your little garage door button and it opens and you pull your car in and then it closes behind you and you don't actually know or talk to any of your neighbors. That's not the way it is in, in Latin America. So mo a great number of the people don't even have a car so then they, they walk to the bus station, they're in, interacting in all these uh, community levels, right? So it's very easy to start a conversation on the street, just walk out the, the back door and walk into the street and there's people walking around. And so you, you pick up a neighbor very easily. So uh, in our central part of the city, uh, we'll be at zone five in the, in the city, we've had numerous conversations where the, the ladies really have focused in on that area during uh, Saturday afternoon or sometime. And so some of the stories there is we have a next door neighbor named Angel Gabriel or the angel Gabriel in English. It sounds different in Spanish, but <laughs> the, he was somebody who's, we can, I can look out my back window and, and see him uh, working on a car. He's a mechanic and we're hanging out on the street corner and he's a, a short indigenous guy, like um, very short, like people there are very short. And he, Lee went up to him and was talking to him about the gospel. And so he gave him a track, and it went like a regular conversation. He read the track, and he was very convicted from the track. He was expecting the track to say uh, about how God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And so then when he was reading it about it, sin and judgment, he was very convicted. And so then he contacted us and talking about how, what a difference this track is. 
So he said, he said he wanted to follow Christ. In the conversations with Lee, he had already explained his background in gangs and his background in, and then that his, his, one of his children had been killed by the gangs in the city. And so then he, in turn, um, went and killed some of the gang members. And so he, he was just describing this to Lee in a conversation. And so then we were kind of left with the, the, in a pickle or in a decision point of, okay, do we invite this guy, which, we, which he's openly admitted that he's killed people, do we invite him to uh, church, which happens to be in the house of somebody that we, that's part of the assembly, or part of the, our church in Guatemala. So we decided that we're going to um, move slow with him. We'll continue to meet with him on a weekly basis, go through hard to believe with him, and see how it goes. So we happen to be going through the book of Mark and the, the story with Matthew, the, the tax collector, and all of his violent friends, and how they come to hear the gospel. So by, by God's sovereignty, we're going, we're going through this text. And so we invited him over for fellowship. Instead of instead of putting the, the church member at risk, we, we decided to invite him over to our, our place. Because he knows where we live anyway, we're across the street. So we invited him in and he was saying, I want you to know I'm a true Christian. I'm a true Christian. Uh, and he used some prosperity kind of, uh, if you know prosperity lingo, he's like, I declare. I declare today that I am a true Christian. And so uh, I was watching Lee, like this is at our kitchen table, you know, dining table with a, a church fellowship. Everybody, everybody from the church comes to, the fe- to church fellowships because we're such a small church, right? And, and so I'm, I'm watching Lee and what happened is within a short time, he went back to the same lifestyle of sin uh, within just a few, a matter of weeks. And it, it ha- what it happened is in his family, it, his girlfriend, long time living girlfriend that they have a baby with, she had gotten a fight with his, with the mother and fist fight. And then it, from that trial, from that trial, he decided to go back to his sinful lifestyle. And so what I'm describing is uh, some of the, an, an, an example of evangelism that didn't end like you would want it to end but it's just what the Bible talks about. It's just like what the Bible talks about with, when trials come and what happens when you, when you preach the gospel. So the same things that happen here, happen there. The same things that happen, so the same things we do here, we do there. It's not any different. What they did in Israel with the disciples, planting churches in Samaria, in Judea, to the ends of the earth, what we do here, we do there. It's not really any gla- more glamorous or any different, it's the same. The same work, just in a different country, different culture, different language, but it's the same work. So another example of evangelism is when Lee and Gabby were, would go out, and we have a supermarket that's across the street. It's kind of like their version of a Publix, right? It's a relatively nice place, and, it, uh, and so the ladies will go there in the parking lot, and it's, the city of Guatemala is full of evangelistic opportunity. They're not so restrictive as here. You know, you go into certain developments and they say, oh, you can't preach gospel in this development. You go to certain apartment complexes, oh, you can't preach the gospel in apartment complexes. Or you go in the mall, oh, you can't preach the gospel in malls. Or you go to Waterford Lakes, oh, you can't go in this strip mall, you can't go preach, preach the gospel. Or you stand up in the bus station down in the Lynx station. Or there's just so many places here where they say, oh, you can't do that. In Guatemala, it's not like that. It's very easy to get an opportunity to be able to preach the gospel. It's rare. You have to go to very rich areas in order to get sh- kicked out. <laughs> There's many, many, many opportunities to preach the gospel there. So one of them is a supermarket. And so the ladies were able to have a conversation with a neighbor named Karen, who was there in the supermarket. And so she's been attending the church for the past month uh, or a month and a half or so. So she's coming out of a difficult background. Her father was murdered and tortured to death when she was three years old. She never knew him. He was a, coming out of a military background in working the police, and then so the gangs are what um, kidnapped him and killed him. 
which is this kind of that kind of story is not that unusual in Guatemala. And so her husband died when about five years ago, is it? And so the, she's a nine-year-old son who really, really didn't know her fa- his father either, named Brandon. And so she has, uh, Gabby is taking her under her wing and teaching her, what does it mean to, to discipline your son? What does it mean to, and how does that apply to the gospel? How does the gospel apply to disciplining your son? How does it, what does it mean for him for the good of his soul to discipline him. And so she's using all different avenues to begin to explain the gospel to her. Karen was somebody who doesn't under, didn't understand the gospel. She would be somebody who would have attended a uh, Prosperity Church just a little bit. And the first service she, she came to, afterwards she came up and she asked me to be a mediator for her. And so I was like asking, what do you mean by that? And she explained that she wanted me to lead her in the sinner's prayer and so that she could be saved. And I explained there's only one mediator between God and man. It's not Mark Mudge, it's uh, Pastor Marcos, it's uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that he didn't say that's how we are, have faith in him, or that's, that's how we become Christians, by sin, pray, praying a sinner's prayer. So um, we're praying the Lord would save her. She's very humble and teachable and continues to come to everything. Last Sunday, a week ago, she's at fellowship, and we try and use every opportunity, every car ride, every fellowship time to be able to explain the gospel to her in a different way. And in every way that we open the Bible and explain it, she's very humble and teachable. We had a, we're going through, on Sunday mornings, a strange fire class, or focusing in on cessationism, charismatic issues, by using that book for them to read and then going through a, a class that's outlined similar to how the book is outlined. So I asked one of the brothers in the church to, to, to get videos, like, kind of like Justin Peters did, but to get them in the Latin world and to find Latin preachers that are, that are doing abuse. So he found one of the brothers in the church, Ricardo Pablo, his face is on one of the pictures over there. He's a white looking tall guy from Argentina. And he's a very studious brother and very uh, zealous brother. So he's able to find some of those videos. He found a video of a guy, what was it? What was a preacher from Costa Rica or something? So the guy's picking up money and he's like dropping the money and he's talking about prosperity. and. He was a very obvious example of prosperity <laughs> preaching, right? But what Karen said is afterwards is, you know what? If I hadn't been here, like in our church, I, um, I probably would have believed what he said. And for me, it was like such an obvious example. I was, I was thinking, oh, Ricardo, why did you get such a obviously bad example <laughs> that everybody's going to know that guy's bad? Nobody would be fooled by that guy. He's got money on the table, dropping it while he's talking. And what's sad is there are many people that are um, deceived and fooled by even what we would consider to be very obvious false teachers. So uh, that's some street evangelism. Uh, Open air uh, has been such a blessing to be able, we've been usually open air preaching in the Central Park there. Lee was able to find a side street that is normally shut off, and so, and it's shut off for people to walk, their shops, street performers are typically on that, that street, and the street is within two like tall buildings downtown that the other building is probably as far away as the wall is from here. And so it kind of protects your voice so that your voice doesn't get lost in a large open area. And so people are able to hear as they pass through in the streets. And in Guatemala, many people stop and listen to the preaching. It's not unusual to preach there and have 20 people, 30 people, all sitting there and listening for half an hour or to an hour and listen to the sermon. And so I began to thinking, man, there's more people listening to my sermons in, in, the, in the park than in church. And so I better, I better bring actual sermons as opposed to just winging it, you know, and just talking about the gospel. So in, in Christmas time, that, the downtown park area was absolutely packed. We had like 50 people uh, listening to a sermon. We tried to do this thing where you do carols and then preach the gospel. 
and, and preaching short sermons. What happened is we first did it is we started to sing. Few people gathered around, and it, maybe it was because of my singing. But the, the a few people ha- gathered around, and then I began to preach, and I planned just to preach for like five minutes. And so then a number of people stopped and were listening to the preaching, and then, so I just preached for a short time, five minutes, 10 minutes, I sat, I went back and we started to sing again and all the people dispersed. <laughs> and so we said, let's just preach instead. So we just, then we just preached and then 50 people listening, uh, it's, a, it's a large amount of people develop, you know, in a circle. Um, and they're listening as we're trying to describe the gospel and really focus in on themes like justification and regeneration because Pentecostals don't understand those themes um, in large part, in large part, and they're essential themes, essential themes. And George Whitfield would focus on those themes in his open-air preaching because of the great ignorance of justification and regeneration. And so we try and focus on those things because they rightly defined, they help you differentiate between the, the lies of uh, the prosperity thinking, and, and ca- Catholic thinking as well. So the one such time, it was only, uh, I think maybe a month ago or so, Lee and I were preaching, 25 people stopping, listening for half an hour on, on a Saturday afternoon, and then afterwards, a, there's a TV channel there that is called Channel 27, and they're known for neo-Pentecostal, sub, kind of subdued uh, Pentecostal prosperity thinking. They're not like crazy, they don't take off their jacket and kind of wing it around, and, uh, but they still have the same beliefs, kind of like a Joel, Joel Osteen. Joel Osteen, he's not, he doesn't do something crazy when he preaches, but he still has that same theology, right? So this Channel 27 is known for that, and so they, they came up afterwards, after preaching, they came up to us and said, oh, do you wanna, um, you wanna take a video? And would you promote our new Moses, Ten Commandments series that's coming out? They had billboards everywhere throughout the city, and I said, well, I'm really thankful for the opportunity, but uh, we, I don't know the movie, so I can't, I can't promote the movie. I'm a, because they were asking if I'm a pastor, they wanted pastors to promote their, uh, make a little commercial so they could play on the TV station. And so I said, yeah, I, I really can't promote that. I just, I don't know the movie. And, but Lee said, but we can talk about the Ten, Ten Commandments. <laughs> we can talk about the purpose of the Ten Commandments because that's the name of this, the, movie, the TV series. And so they said, okay, let's do that. And so we talked about the purpose of the Ten Commandments and how it drives us to Christ. And so I, I don't know whether they put the video on the TV station or not, <laughs> but it was a very good idea from, from Lee. And so uh, we've also been able to use, Lee will also sometimes uh, play the drums downtown and people will come and listen to the drums and then he stands up after playing the drums and then preaches the gospel to the crowd. So he's, he's done that on numerous occasions, and that also has gathered many people, many her, people have heard the gospel from that. The, another type of evangelism that I've been excited about is what I would consider synagogue evangelism. So how I would define that is inviting yourself to a religious group and having the opportunity to be able to preach the gospel to them. So in other words, so begin to... Uh, here, I had wanted to do that, but I know like Edgar has opportunities to do that. Edgar gets invited to churches around Florida or goes and preaches to them or has these kind of connections. I never had that until I got to Guatemala. Then I'm like, wait a minute, I'm the missionary. I'm the missionary and pe- people will invite a missionary to come and preach their church. So I thought, well, let's just start inviting ourselves to do churches and see if we can go and preach the gospel there. So. We started in our neighborhood, so we'd go up to some Pentecostal churches that, in the neighborhood and buy ourselves, hey, I'm a missionary, my name's Mark, I live across the street, and, I'm, and uh, I would like to be able to preach the gospel 
youth group, whatever, here's our doctrine, here's our gospel track. Um, here, we believe this is our, our doctrine, 1689. Call us back if you're, you need somebody to preach to, and we'll, we'll preach the gospel. And so uh, we got rejected a few times. They, they were very friendly. They just didn't give us a call back. And so, but then other opportunities are beginning to have opened up in that regard. Uh, Edgar went to a conference in, in California where at John MacArthur's church for Spanish pastors or the um, church that's associated, that's right next to um, Grace Community in California. So there was a brother from that church in California named Rodolfo. He drives two hours every Sunday in order to get to, to church. So he... Uh, so everybody in the West Side don't feel uh, like you, you drive a long, long ways. It's, it's not a burden for him. It's a joy for him to, in California to drive two hours. He's a very joyful, zealous brother. He, he has family who had a Bible study in Guatemala. And so we were in the west, south side of the city, a poorer area. And so we were able to go there and preach the gospel to a Bible study uh, of people there. We were able to preach the gospel at funerals. We've been able to preach the gospel at, there's somebody Jeffrey Johnson knows. If you remember Jeffrey Johnson, a pastor who came to conf- conference on Islam, he, he knows somebody who's Guatemalan who lives in Kansas, and so she's been inviting all her family and all of her friends to come. Some people have come to the church and visited from her friends, and so her family, God willing, when we come back, her family has a Bible study, and then we're going to visit that Bible study for another synagogue evangelism. There's also a, you, you saw the video of a couple named Joshua and Monica. They're a, a new, they've been coming to the church, very committed to the church, very joyful, thankful to be following the Lord. They believe they've become believers in, a couple, in the past couple of years. And so he, his father, has been a Pentecostal Assemblies of God pastor. And so he's had the opportunity in a very small church to be able to have a, uh, a regular time to preach there. And so when he started to come to the church, he, started, he said, well, this is what I've been doing. I've been doing this, going to this um, church. For some personal reasons, his, his father is not qualified to be um, running that church anymore. So he's trying to step out by March, he's trying to get out of this group. So he's trying to get his son to take it over. And so his son is, is saying, what should I do? And so I said, well, you should come to our church and be disciple and then try and change the time for that service. So he was able to do that. He's able to come to our church in the morning. We don't have an evening service at this time. So he's able to change that group to be the evening service time on the north side of the city. We were meeting on the south side of the city. So he's able to come to church with us and then still be able to preach at this group. So how, how that went before we started was I was, I was saying, okay, we're gonna go, um, I'm gonna disciple you in this. I'm gonna help you to learn how to preach. And, um, but this is how it's gonna go. Watch in the Bible with synagogue evangelism. What happens? Uh, it separates. It separates, it divides. When the message is very clear, then by God's grace, some people believe and, and other people don't. So as we started there, well, like I got the opportunity to go and preach at the uh, place. And so I, I preached on the Beatitudes and what is a true Christian, what is not someone who's not. How do you know from how Christ describes what a, what a true Christian is? And so um, afterwards, people were like, um, you remember with Ezekiel? In Ezekiel, people said, oh, that's a beautiful song. Yeah, it's, it's the way you preach, it sounds very... Uh, so afterwards, it was like that. People were going, oh, you know, thank you for that word. It seemed that way. Like they said, oh, that, well, your preaching was a beautiful song, but they don't go and do what, or examine themselves or test themselves. So afterwards, Joshua was like, oh, it seemed like it went well. It seemed like it went well. And I, was like, I was like, smile and nod, just smile and nod, Mark. <laughs> and we'll wait <laughs> to see how it goes. So he, he Joshua's dad wanted him, Um, Joshua to preach and not so much um, me to regularly preach so him and his and his dad were then taking turns so we would just go the weeks that Joshua was preaching and we were trying to make uh, make it known to him that this is a this is a evangelistic time that should be our focus 
Don't think of it as a, a church. Think of it as an evangelistic time. And so afterwards, the Russies and I, would, we would go, and afterwards we'd have conversations with people, and we'd try and help him grow in his preaching. Within a few times of preaching, uh, and a few conversations afterwards, for example, one, the guy who owns the building that they meet in, the name is Pedro, Lee had, would, would continue to have conversations with him. And Pedro was very religious. He's maybe a man about 50 years old, 55, and he likes the book of Revelation. He likes to talk about the Bible. And Lee would come up to him and say, how do you, how do you know, um, how, what's, the, what's the gospel? How does somebody go to heaven when you die? And Pedro would talk about revelation and many religious things and have many words about the Bible, but wouldn't answer about the basic question about what's the gospel? How do you go to heaven when you die? How do you have your sins forgiven? So Lee would kindly ask it in a, the same question in a different way. And then he kindly asked the same question in a different way. And he asked the same question in another way. And then he would plainly say, Pedro, you don't, you don't know the gospel. This is the gospel. What Jesus Christ has done, he's died on the cross for us. He's the only way we would have our sins forgiven. We need to repent and believe in this good news. And so the next week, Lee would come back and, and do the same thing. Pedro, how did somebody um, go to heaven? Do you understand, did you understand from the message? How does somebody go to heaven when they die? And Pedro wouldn't be able to, didn't have eyes to see, didn't have ears to hear. But uh, instead, he was kind to Lee's face, but, and then behind, later on, he was asking that we wouldn't come back anymore. So those doors are beginning to close. We preach the gospel to most people there. There's only two families left. And so instead of continuing to, to, to go there, we're going to try and focus on those two families that we haven't talked with. Otherwise, we've had personal conversations with everybody else one-on-one and preach the gospel to them. And so it's an example of synagogue evangelism that it's, it's a great joy to have these opportunities I was saying to one brother um, early, earlier this week that, you know, I used to think here when I preach at Crane's Roost or something, if only people would stop and listen. People just, so many people just go by. If they would just stop and listen, or uh, you hand them the track, if they would just read the track, so few people read the track. In Guatemala, many people read the track. Many people get the track and while you're handing out tracks and they read it there right in front of you. They sit down and they read the whole thing and you watch them reading the, the whole thing on the street corner. And, or many people hear the gospel. And it makes me think of the gospels where many thousands heard Jesus Christ himself explaining the gospel. Who could do it more lovingly? Who could do it more clearly? Who could do it more boldly than Jesus Christ? perfectly preaching the gospel and it makes me more and more of a Calvinist that the one he who has ears to hear let, let him hear if you have eyes to see right so we see more and more that conversion is a miracle conversion is a miracle and that it's a work of God it's a work of God and that's what makes it last too that's what makes it last that it's a work of God and so that's what we pray for, we long for, and we have faith that the Lord will use these many um, opportunities and many different doors. So the city is full of evangelistic opportunity. Now, uh, now I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit to cover the other aspects of the ministry. So we, we have many opportunities for evangelism, and then discipleship is something that we really want to focus in on. We have a small group of um, people in the church, um, some of the um, some relatives from Pastor Victor from Miami. If he, you know, he's come before for a marriage conference last year, and he's a good brother with a good church there. And some of his family comes to the church. There's a Argentinian brother who's a very, uh, very encouraging. Named Carlos Pablo. There's Joshua and Monica, and then there's the Rusis and us, and then there's people who've come from evangelism. There's also people who are interested in the church, that, but they're thinking about whether they're going to. Um, move from the U.S. One a couple that's living in Texas. They heard about us from the website. So there's when you look for a Reformed Baptist Church in Guatemala, we are the only ones for sure. <laughs> We're the only ones. So 
having a website that talks about how a Reformed Baptist is, has been a very great help. Because how do people come to our church? They, they come to our church not from, uh, they come to it from, by the preaching of the gospel. Either they hear online somebody preaching the gospel, Paul Washer, Miguel Nunez, Suhel Michelin, some of these reformed Spanish pre- preachers, they hear on the, the, the gospel on the internet or they hear the gospel from us in the street. That's how people are gonna end up coming to the church and, and remaining with us. People who come looking for a show or looking to be served, just like here, the, the people who have come here from driving by the church and they're like, oh, I'm gonna try that out. They're very often the ones who walk out before the service ends. Uh, the people who stay here are the people who are being having the gospel preached to them, understanding the difference, whether it's the gospel preached in another church or online or another, another place, or whether they've heard it from us preach the gospel. So it's the same there in Guatemala. And so I'm very thankful for this group of believers. We're very excited. I'm wanting to disciple them. And it's a great blessing to be able to, for me as a pastor to spend, personally spend time with each of the men in the church that's something I only could have dreamed of here and I would have desired to do, but there it has, it's a great joy and blessing of the dynamic of being able to disciple each guy. So with, with Joshua, the, the guy in the video, young guy in the video, it, I've been able to disciple him on how to read his Bible. After hearing him preach, I thought, well, well the place to start is he needs to learn how to read his Bible how to make observations, how to make interpretation, how to make an application. And so I've seen him grow and have a great hunger for the word of God through these basic things. And it was very encouraging to see him grow and just learning how to read his Bible, him and his wife. They would do that together. And with Ricardo Pablo, another good brother, he's been a Christian for about four years, I believe, and he knows a lot of theology. He's the one who's the most theologically astute in our church, besides Lee. And the, uh, he reads, has a great appetite to, to read, and to read good literature. And so he, we went through this Trellis and the Vine with him. That's a book on disciple making and how everyone is to be a disciple maker. And that that's how healthy churches are developed and that how they're able to raise up pastors from within the midst it, that's the ideal. That's the ideal for what a church should be is to be able to have like Pastor Michael and Pastor Dale where they're, we've known them for many years and they're raised up among us and we're able to recognize their lives and their doctrine and their abilities. And so how, does that, how do things like that happen? Well, it happens by everyone understanding they, everyone has a responsibility to be a disciple maker. And so Ricardo Pablo, a good brother who's been hearing good preaching, reading great books on his own, but on his own, not within a good church, what does he need to grow in? He needs to grow in humble service in the local, local church, the nitty gritty local church, and getting his hands dirty, learning to sacrifice for others, and learning how to be discipled and to disciple others, how to be poured into and how to pour your life into others. And that, that is how the, the commandments of, of Christ are passed on and what it means to follow Christ is passed on. So that's been a great joy, great blessing. We are now, um, we're now switching to uh, focusing on Deuteronomy. We're studying Deuteronomy and how to study our Bibles. It's, and it's a great joy to me to see how the people in the church are so studious with their, their studies in Deuteronomy. To come back you know, with their inductive um, sheet like you know how Pastor Rick makes an inductive Bible study sheet when you're going through a book, and then they come back and have that all filled out with, with all the different notes and have them hungry with like a fork and knife ready to be taught the word. As extremely encouraging as a pastor to, to see them have the, put in the effort to know God's word. So the, now as a church plant, some of the things that we are focusing in on is um, the, I'm taking Spanish classes, that's necessary for the, for the church plant, and necessary, I'm not able to preach yet, I'm teaching in Spanglish. Um, so Lee, I'm trying to teach classes, 
and then in Spanish, and it's going, it's rough, it's rough. Lee helps me out, and sometimes the ladies are like, have been, and Lee have been like, it's just better if you teach in English for now. Keep growing, keep going to classes, and it's, it's clearer if we just translate for now. So I'm, it's work, I'm working on it, please pray for me, I wanna be humble and be corrected. It's a great opportunity for me to grow in humility, to be constantly corrected by everyone in the church <laughs> on my Spanish and pronunciation, syntax, vocabulary, everything. So um, it is growing, but, and it's necessary, but I would have the goal of wanting to be able to preach sim- uh, simple sermons by October or something like that. I would want to have the goal of teaching by something in the summertime uh, on my own. So we'll see how that goes. And please keep that in prayer. We're going through the book of Mark, verse by verse, Sunday mornings. We're going through Sunday school. It is, what we, ha- we have in our church is, we we'll focus on small group time on Sunday mornings as opposed to the weekday. Because in Guatemala, it's more difficult to make it during a midweek service because of a number of people, maybe they have a car, they don't have a car, so they're riding the bus, and traffic there is on another level. It's, uh, it's another level of, um, imagine everywhere is like I-4. Um, the, all the side streets like I-4 <laughs> during traffic time. Edgar, Edgar knows he's driven uh, where it takes that hour and a half, two hours, what time we try to get across the city during rush hour, and that's not unusual. So in order to have, having a midweek service, and when we're also, we're spread out too. Having a, a biblical church is, is not unusual to have the people spread out because the, it's, it's rare for someone to have eyes to see and ears to hear. And when they do, then they see it's worth the distance to be able to drive to it. So we're, we're like the, uh, Cornerstone in that respect that, that we're relatively spread out. Uh, so we tr- the point is, we have our small group time at Sunday school we, in order to try and help that and to make those essential times for a member of the church to be Sunday school and the Sunday service that morning time. So that's when we do our accountability, our prayer together, and we do our, we, we do our studies through Strange Fire. And then in the midweek study, if you're able to make that, then we focus in on study in Deuteronomy, the inductive study. Um, we're looking for a central church location, and so uh, please keep us in prayer with that. We were supposed to be moving forward to a central, central location, in, but it didn't work out. The, uh, they were having meetings, and it doesn't look like it's gonna work out that location. So we're, that's a continual thing that I'm doing on the side, is looking for a place that's um, gonna be an area that's not too rich or not too poor, so that all different demographics of the people can be able to come, a place that has access by the bus, a place that is central to the city, a place that is, has, is cheap enough, and a place that's large enough. So all those factors, they, it's difficult to find a place that fits all of those, those things. So working, I've been working on that for some months, so that, uh, because during our evangelism, a lot of people uh, were, were a ways out from the, the city where we're meeting now in one of the homes of the brothers. It's better to have a central location starting out. So that's some of the things that we're doing with evangelism, discipleship, and the church plant. Uh, to close, I would just want to express my gratitude to you all. Uh, the, there are many, many, many times where I have been so grateful for all of the things the Lord has taught me here through you all and with you all, whether a trial or a doctrine or a practice, there's just, it's hard to describe how much and how, what a blessing it was to be serving the Lord with you all here um, for can't remember how many years I was here, about a, de- about a decade, um, maybe a little bit more. But the, there's so many times, so many conversations, so many shepherding issues 
where I can look back on what I've learned here and how I was uh, discipled here and how what a blessing has been to me. And so I, want, I would want by that, expressing that thanks to encourage you to press on and encourage you to persevere, encourage you to be discipled and to disciple others here, for you to be evangelizing here, for you to be humble and taking, like uh, applying the marriage conference. And uh, what a blessing the marriage conference was to me to just sit and be preached to. Uh, as a pastor who doesn't have other pastors, you know, that in, in Guatemala, it is a great blessing to be preached to. Um, and I just want to express my thankfulness and your providing. Um, most, the majority, we've, you know, there's other churches that pray for us and support us, but most of the uh, financial support has been from you all. And I often um, tell the people there that look at how um, we haven't come and asked you for money and we're not, um, and you don't have the burden of um, trying to pay for me to, to preach to you all because of other brothers who've sacrificed and other brothers who have um, been generous and kind in another place so that you could hear the gospel. And they, they have expressed the thankfulness, like, like Joshua and Monica in that video. That's, that's a, um, other brothers are thankful like that for your sacrifice to be able to send us there. And so I, I know that that, like uh, Philippians 4, I know that you're receiving uh, a great blessing out of seeing the fruit of that, that ministry. And um, I'm, not, I'm not doing that to ask for more support. I'm, um, you guys have supported me plenty. I've, uh, our needs are provided for. I'm just wanting to express thanks, that's all. Um, so things to pray for. Oh, and one thing I would want to express thanks to is, I don't know if Lee and Gabby are watching, but they, they probably are having to leave now for church. But often we eat breakfast and we watch Sunday school. And right around this time, we're running out the door at, right at, <laughs> and in needing to close the laptop with Pastor Rick's face in it, you know, just, <laughs> just as, he, as he's closing. <laughs> but the I I asked my wife what's the, what's the one thing if you had to say you're most thankful for for our time in Guatemala and she said the Russies um, Lee and Gabby have been it's been such a blessing to be able to serve with them uh, and so I would want to give thanks to God for the work that He's done in them and I know you re, give, would do the same that it. It's such a joy to be so like-minded with someone and to be on the battlefront with someone, not just doctrinally, but in practice. That to have so many conversations with somebody and then with Lee and then to walk away and I'm thinking one thing, but I'm wanting to hear his opinion first and he has the same exact opinion about what the person need to hear about the gospel or what shepherding issue or what, whatever. It's so encouraging to be so like-minded and for them to be sacrificing, for them to be serving faithfully with us and the joy being able to see. The, when you live with somebody, you know, there's a, there's a phrase in Guatemala, you want to know somebody, live with them. That's a, a common phrase there. And... So it is a great joy to be able to live with them, see them um, pastor their sons, see them uh, in their faithfulness with us. So things to pray for. Um, things to pray for. If you, you want to write th this down, uh, please pray that the Lord will provide us with a church location that would be... You, it, Providing, praying for a church location at this point in the church plant is kind of like, you know, you're praying for somebody to marry. You're like, you, you don't know all that you, <laughs> you don't even know how to pray for all that you need when the Lord provides you with a spouse. You know that it, the Lord has to do that. The Lord has to do that, right? It's kind of like that with a church location because in the church location, there's so much impact and so much that's gonna happen from that because you're gonna, that's gonna be a center for evangelism there's going to be people that are going to hear the gospel as a result of where that church is that wouldn't otherwise. 
And so we're asking for the Lord would guide us and provide for us in that church location. So that's one. Two, please pray for labors for the harvest. It's exciting to be able to see some of the brothers be discipled in evangelism with us, like Ricardo now, and uh, in Joshua, and the, some of the ladies. But please pray for more laborers for the harvest. Uh, the l- harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few in Guatemala. You just, when you go to like a Central Park and you just see th- hundreds and thousands of people pass by, and you see that there's, there's no way to reach this four million people uh, on, on your own. So th- there's a great need for labors for the harvest. So church location, labors for the harvest, excuse me, and then Ephesians 1, verses 15 to 23. In Ephesians 1, verses 15 to 23, uh, Paul prays for the, the believers in Ephesus and the region of Laodicea there that, that they would grow in an understanding of the hope they have in, in their calling in Christ, that they would grow in their joy for the, in the inheritance that they have in Christ, and that they would grow in the understanding of the power that they've received in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I remember that by the acronym HIP. Are you HIP? Hope, inheritance, power. Um, so that those, the way Paul prays for the believers there uh, are you hip to pray for pray for those things? Hope, inheritance, power. That you pray that the church there would grow in their saying of those things. And in that Ephesians one, you can see how Paul is been faithful. And so I uh, I also express my great faith, thankfulness to you all for your faithfulness and prayers. Churches in New Reformed Baptist Church in New Jersey, uh, Spanish speaking is, is praying for us on a regular basis. There's a church in Costa Rica. That's a Reformed Baptist church, and they're praying for us on a regular basis. The church in Miami is um, with Pastor Victor. They're praying for us on a regular basis, and I know you all are praying for us on a regular basis. And so all the good things that have happened uh, have been, I see them as a result of the Lord working through prayer. So I, I plead and ask that you would continue to pray for us. Uh, so thank you for uh, hearing this update in Guatemala. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to answering your questions in the hallway or tonight if you're able to come. It would be a, a joy. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the, the blessing of being back here with family. Thank you for being able to worship you together. Thank you for, I pray that you would have help them to grow in an understanding of the inheritance that they have received in the gospel. I pray that you would help them to to, to take greater joy and have greater faith in the hope of their calling. I pray that you would help them to grow and be confident and apply the the truths of your power in salvation. So I pray, Lord, that you would bless cornerstone and bring them have them to have more labors for the harvest and help them to grow and persevere here in this city amen